sponsored by HUD's Office of Community Planning and Development, or CPD. My name is John Maga, and I work at the National Center on Family Homelessness, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. On behalf of CPD, I would like to thank all of you for joining us. Today's webinar is Data-Driven Planning for the Consolidated Plan. And before we begin, I would like to make some logistical announcements. Today's webinar will last approximately 90 minutes, and the webinar is being recorded. The recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be posted next week on the Consolidated Plan website on the TA and training page. As an attendee of this webinar, your microphone will automatically be muted. Please listen to the presentation through your phone for best results. The call-in information has been sent to you, and it's also listed on the bottom portion of your meeting room screen under audio instructions. Another option is to use your computer speakers. This means that you will need to turn on and turn up the speakers on your computer. Due to the large number of attendees, there may be a slight delay in the advancement of the slides. If you experience any other te technical difficulties, please let us know by using the Q&A box on your screen. You can also submit content-related questions using the same box, and we will try to address them during the presentation. Immediately following the webinar, you will be directed to a post-webinar survey. Participants are strongly encouraged to respond to the evaluation to inform the delivery of future webinars, and we greatly appreciate your participation in that. Today's webinar will feature the following presenters, Caitlin Ott, Assistant Project Manager, and Meg Barclay, Project Manager, both of whom work at the CPD office. Additionally, Alex Thackeray and Lee Higgins of Econometrica will be helping Meg and Caitlin answer your questions today. And now I'd like to pass this over to Meg to begin the presentation. Thanks, John. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us on today's webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to demonstrate the data-driven planning toolkit, which will be available to grantees by the end of August. This toolkit is designed to help HUD grantees who want to make their consolidated plans more data-driven and place-based. HUD's new econ planning suite provides data, maps, and templates to assist in the completion of the consolidated plan. To make these resources easier to use, HUD is developing a number of toolkits that should assist grantees to analyze data and use the mapping tools. The Data-Driven Decision-Making Toolkit is one of these toolkits. It will include a set of spreadsheets and a guidebook. The spreadsheets will become populated with data from CPD maps and have formulas embedded in them to do basic calculations. The toolkit guide will provide step-by-step -step instructions on how to use the spreadsheets and assist users to interpret and use the results to make program and funding decisions in the consolidated plan and annual action plan. The data-driven and place-based approach can help grantees round out their understanding of community needs and market conditions and to develop priorities and strategies. An understanding of community housing and economic development data can also inform the public participation and consultation aspects of planning. The methods described in this webinar will help grantees integrate their needs assessments and market analyses as the basis of their specific affordable housing and community development strategies. The graphic on this slide depicts the structure of the existing regulations, which actually envision a process where a multi-year strategy and subsequent funding decisions are driven equally by public participation, needs assessment, and market analysis. Data on housing problems and market analysis and the economic context, supplemented by outside data provided by the grantee, can be very helpful in developing the consolidated plans priorities, strategies, and actions especially the needs assessment and market analysis components. There are many benefits from using data in the planning process. Data can provide a context for meetings with the public and, and in consultation with partners. It can help in the creation of challenging yet attainable goals in the strategic plan. It can also be used to help planners explain their recommendations to decision makers and the public. And finally, good data analysis can make plans more likely to have the, in, the impact that grantees desire helping them to be even more effective. The three primary components of the econ planning suite are expanded planning data, CPD maps, and the electronic submission of consolidated plans through IDIS. 
These three components work together to facilitate the planning process for grantees. It's now easier to collect the data, analyze and understand the data, and incorporate data into the consolidated plan and the annual action plan. HUD now provides a wide range of data across all grantee jurisdictions and all uses of grant funds, and this data is accessible publicly through CPD maps which provides the capability for both grantees and the public to create maps and reports that illustrate community needs. And the Data-Driven Planning Toolkit will provide assistance with analyzing affordable housing and economic development using this data and these maps. The electronic submission template in IDIS meets the Consolidated Plan regulatory requirement, and pre-populated tables with the data from CPD maps can be a starting point for analysis and public participation. While the Econ Planning suite of tools provides what is needed for basic analysis and meeting regulatory requirements, HUD is developing a number of toolkits to help grantees that want to, to take data-driven and place-based decision-making to the next level. The Data-Driven Decision-Making Toolkit is one of these tools. As we said before, it will include spreadsheets and a guide to help grantees analyze and interpret the data. And while the spreadsheets and guide will be useful for housing and economic development analysis, for both, excuse me, for both housing and economic development analysis, this webinar is going to focus on housing issues as an example. The toolkit provides pre-programmed Excel spreadsheets to facilitate analysis and a guide to lead the user through the, these spreadsheets step by step. The spreadsheets will be programmed to take data directly from CPD maps reports downloaded by the user. Once the data is in, the toolkit follows three stages of data-driven planning that we will discuss during this webinar. Issue identification, issue characterization, and issue location, where the toolkit ties back into CPD maps. The toolkit will also include examples of how data can help grantees develop priorities, set goals, and take actions to accomplish these goals. For those who want to know more about the housing issues affecting them, there are advanced analysis spreadsheets that you also use data from outside CPD maps. CPD Maps is a powerful tool that provides a wide range of data on housing needs and supply, demographics, and economic conditions for data-driven decision-making. Access to CPD Maps and a guide on using it is available on HUD's website, at the, and the address will be on, the, um, on a screen at the end of this webinar. It's also on this screen. There are a number of preset or CAN maps in CPD maps that are easy to pull and, and use in your analysis. So here on the screen we have an example of that. It's the need for rental rehab. And this map shows the percent of properties built before 1980 as that thematic or colored scheme where the higher, the tracks with a higher percentage of housing built before 1980 are in the darker colors. Um, low to moderate income census tracks, and those tracks are outlined in green. And tax credit and public, public housing pro project, sorry, locations, which are those um, different points that you see on the map, the little houses in green, pink, and purple. Users can also build custom maps to examine variables of particular interest, including but not limited to levels of crowding and owner-occupied housing, income level, and racial composition. But then maps can also be used to identify hot spots where investment might be focused to address specific needs. Here we have an example of some of the data that are provided in the grantee summary in CPD maps and also through the reports widget, some basic housing data. As mentioned in the previous slide, the data-driven decision-making toolkit can assist grantees to make data analysis a valuable part of the planning process. It's important to note here that what we're going to demonstrate is based on a draft of the toolkit. We'll also be demonstrating, or we'll also be, we will be make, doing some work on this through the end of the month before it's released. Uh, so some of the things that you see here may change. Um, and we aren't doing a live demonstration. This is a demonstration of what the toolkit will look like. When the toolkit's released, it will be posted on the Consolidated Plan website. The toolkit, um, in this, toolkit, users will simply download reports for their jurisdiction and comparison jurisdictions from CPD map, maps, excuse me, save them to a file, and the data will be automatically loaded into the spreadsheets for the three stages that you see here on the screen. 
During this webinar, we'll focus only on the housing portion of the toolkit, as I said before. The three stages um, that, are, that are included in the toolkit include stage one, issue identification. This stage takes a look at the big picture. What are the primary issues of concern in your jurisdiction? Stage two is issue characterization and allows you to take a deeper look at the issues identified in stage one. For those grantees who want to know even more about the housing issues affecting them, we will also discuss advanced issue characterization, which relies on data from outside CPD maps to provide a more comprehensive picture. And this, the last stage is issue location. This stage ties back to CPD maps to help users understand where the issues identified in the prior two stages are most prevalent in their jurisdiction and what resources are located nearby. In stage one, issue identification, spreadsheets will pull data from CPD maps reports from multiple jurisdictions. These embedded formulas will compare your jurisdiction to other jurisdictions you choose. The other jurisdiction should include a larger geographic area in which your jurisdiction is located, such as the state, and if desired, another area similar to your jurisdiction. It's important to include the nation as part of all the comparisons, as you'll see in the later slides, as state and local jurisdictions may have similar problems that mask substantial problems when making a comparison. As we'll see, comparing your jurisdiction to others helps identify issues of greater concern. The comparative analysis should be used to help the jurisdiction understand which issues which should be examined in greater depth. It should also be noted that the data as they are presented on these spreadsheets are estimates from most, most often the American Community Survey that have some larger mar margins of error. They should be used as indicators to inform decision making, not as highly precise metrics. Thus, results that come from these data should be considered informative, but not prescriptive. As we said before, the webinar focuses on a housing issues example, and we're going to start walking through one of those examples now. The areas of greatest concern will be highlighted in the spreadsheet and can be one of the three housing problem areas that we have data on. Cost burden households and severe cost burden households, which are households paying 30% or more and those paying 50% or more of their income on housing costs, respectively. Crowded and severely crowded households. These are crowded households are those with one or more person per room and overcrowded households are those with 1.5 or more persons per room. And substandard The issue identification tool highlights demographic conditions that may impact the jurisdiction's planning, such as high proportion of elderly or low-income households. So on this screen, we see the variables that are part of the housing issues example spreadsheet. And as um, this is designed really to give the community a basic overview of its most prominent issues based on comparisons to other jurisdictions. And this, this Housing example issue examines the nine variables that are listed on this slide. The first three housing variables were discussed on the previous slide, and they relate to potential housing problems like cost burden or crowded households, while the last seven relate to those demographic conditions we mentioned. The demographic variables in the right column on the slide were selected because they describe the nature of the potential problems and their solutions. Poverty rates and income can tell about the resources of households to address the problems themselves. The percent of elderly, elderly residents can apply the need for specific types of facilities and services. Similarly, the percentage of the population that is less than 18 years of age can result in a greater demand for specific facilities and services, such as schools or larger housing units. A high proportion of renters may also cause a community to look into the need for more rental housing or increased home ownership opportunities depending on market conditions. These are the criteria that are used to determine how each variable may be highlighted for the differences between compared geographies. The criteria the, or the thresholds for each criteria are, are different for each variable. As a reminder, the thresholds and color scheme in this webinar are based on the draft tool and may be adjusted when the final tool is completed. In the case of substandard housing as an example, if Townville, we're going to use an example, um, we've made up a town called Townville for this webinar. If the Townville's rate of substandard housing is one and a quarter times higher, here we see in that, in that first circled column, if it's one and a quarter times higher, 
then the comparison place is considered slightly higher, and that variable would be highlighted in that light, lighter blue color. If it's cost burden variable down here, it's 10, is 10 percentage points or higher, or up to 20 percentage points, say 47% compared to 35, of then that of the comparison geography, then it's colored in that median blue color. If it's more than 20 percent percentage points higher, that means the variable is going to be highlighted in the darker, darkest blue color. Those variables that are lower, either in percentage points or by ratio, are highlighted in green. It's, it should be noted here, too, that the median owner value and median contract rent are measured in terms of the national average. And so the U.S. value is always going to be 100, and all of the comparison values will be a percentage of that. These thresholds are set based on analysis that our TA provider, Econometrica, has done on this data, but they can be adjusted in the toolkit's control panel if there are numbers that are more meaningful to you. And now we're going to, based on the, the previous slide, we have our first poll question. The question here is, based on the issue criteria we discussed in the previous slide, the color scheme, what is Townville's biggest housing problem? And that's within those three problems that are highlighted there, or circled there in the red. So your choices are substandard housing, overcrowding, and cost burden. Keeping in mind that the darkest blue color means the biggest difference. Give everybody a little bit of time to respond. Looks like most people are choosing overcrowded housing, and that's right. So according to the, the analysis that the spreadsheet has done here, Townville has a much higher rate of overcrowding than the United States as a whole, and so it is flagged in that darker blue color. Cost burden is also a problem, but it's not as, as big a difference, even though it's a bigger number, it's not as different from the nation as a whole as overcrowding is. Move on to the next slide. And this is where we see our answer. Oh, whoops. I already flipped to our answer. So Townville's overcrowding rate is three times the national rate, while Townville's cost burden rate is 10 percentage points higher than the national rate. So now we'll move on to the next, the next slide. Before we take a closer look at these housing issues, we also want to take a look at what this table is telling us about Townville's demographics. We're still comparing Townville's data to the nation as a whole, as indicated by that the U.S. data all being shaded in that gray color. We see here that Townville has a higher poverty rate when compared to the nation as well as the state. It has a slightly higher population under 18 than the nation, but a lower portion of its population over 65. Finally, we can see that Townville's renter rate is high, particularly relative to the national rate. Stated conversely, Townville has a low homeownership rate. The median owner value and the median contract rent may help explain the high renter rate. What does this table tell us about all the planners of Townville? First, the crowding may be the most important issue, followed by the cost burden issue, while substandard housing appears to be less of an issue among housing issues. However, neither the crowding nor the cost burden issues are much different than what is happening in the state or the nearby jurisdiction. Thus, these issues may arise from regional housing market conditions, which will likely affect their Townville strategy for dealing with them. The issue identification stage also provides an overview of the issues a jurisdiction faces to better understand the nature of their issues, and more but more details are needed. So we move on to stage two, issue characterization. The issue characterization stage of the tool provides, of this toolkit will provide more data to help users take a deeper look at the issues identified in the first stage and answer questions like, what is the nature of these issues identified in stage one? What types of households are affected by these issues? What are the income ranges affected? How has the issue been trending over time? 
And specific to housing, it might it will help us answer, question, answer questions like, are renters or homeowners more affected? And what are the characteristics of the housing market that contribute to the issues identified? In the case of housing problems, the tool provides three tables with more detailed data about the particular housing problems, substandard housing, overcrowded households, and cost burdened households. Users may want to examine all three issues in depth using this tool or focus on the specific issues identified in stage one. As in stage one, the data required for the spreadsheets in stage two comes from CPD maps. But we'll also discuss advanced issue characterization options that require data from other sources. On this slide, continuing with our Townville example, we examine the details of the crowding problem identified as Townville's most serious issue. The data here take into account two new factors. Severe crowding, which again, as we mentioned before, is where you have one, more than 1.5 persons per room, and tenure, whether the property is owner or renter occupied. So our poll question on this slide is, do, town, do owners or renters in Townville have a bigger problem with severe crowding, compared, and this is compared to the nation as a whole? So owners or renters? And severe overcrowding, we're looking at this line here, owner 1.5 plus per room and renter 1.5 plus per room. Giving you a little bit of time. So it looks like we have the majority of folks answering that owners have a bigger problem with severe overcrowding in Townville. And we go to our next slide and we see, and in fact, we're right. The overcrowding problem is more severe around, among owners, but we also see here that it actually affects more renters in real numbers. Oh, look. there's more to say about this slide. To better understand the situation, additional data on income and the availability of units will also be example, examined to get a fuller picture of the crowding issue and possible solutions. Note here that the data on the issue characterization stage also include the total number of households involved to give some idea of the extent of the problem. For this example, the data on the number of households shows that Townville has 3,700 crowded over owner-occupied units compared to 10,000 crowded rental units. This shows that while severely crowded owner-occupied households are a relatively serious problem. There are more renters with crowding issues than owners. Next, the toolkit helps us to look deeper into Townville's overcrowding problem. We first can focus on owner-occupied units. So we see here the slide, the data here is focusing on owner-occupied units. Up here, we see that the, all of this data is, is addressing owner-occupied units. The table shows us that crowding and severe crowding problems for owners by shows us the, the sorry excuse me shows us the crowding and severe crowding problems for owners by income level. We see that the severe crowding problem is not among the very lowest income. It's not here among zero to thirty percent of area median income. Rather, it is more prominent for those with, with income above thirty percent of the area median income. However, we can also see that for the most part, Townville's overcrowding situation is not very different from new states, except for the much higher rate of severe overcrowding in the 30 to 50 percent of AMI range, this variable here that's circled. Thus, Townville must address the issue in a housing market that's not only cost burdened, as we saw in step one, but also has a general overcrowding problem. Particularly of interest are the more than 600 severely overcrowded households in the 30, sorry, 30 to 100% of AMI range. That's a fairly large number of owner-occupied homes with more than 1.5 persons per room. To get a better handle on this issue, we may also want to know how has the overcrowding problem in Townville changed since 2000? This is addressed in the advanced issue characterization analysis in a couple of slides from now. 
If this becomes a Townville priority, we will want to know where in Townville these homes are located. And this is also going to be the focus of stage three, where we tie back to CPD maps. But now let's take a look at overcrowding among renter households. As we saw in the first issue characterization slides, Townville also has a crowding problem in its rental units that accounts for many more households, about 10,000. Overcrowded renters compared to, I'm sorry, about 10,000 overcrowded renters compared to about 3,700 overcrowded owners. Planners need to understand what the different strategies are for dealing with owner-occupied versus rental property overcrowding. When looking at Townville's overcrowded rental properties by income level, you can see that all of the numbers are darker blue now. In part, this has to do with adding criteria such as income. However, this also has to do with how small numbers should be interpreted. So it's like, this is a good example of understanding what to do when you have really small numbers in some of these, um, in some of these categories. It's much easier to get a high multiple, the criteria for determining the severity of the issue, or here why we're seeing these dark blue fields, when you have really small numbers. Thus, it's important to look not just at how the tool flags the values in these tables, but how the values themselves throughout the planning process change. The guide that will accompany the toolkit will explain this and provide more information on how to interpret these detail, this, this data in more detail. Similar to owner properties, Townville has a much higher percentage of renter households with overcrowding than the nation, but it is tracking with state levels pretty closely. Thus, it appears the crowding is a large problem across new state and not specific to Townville. So we'll look deeper at what the data can tell us about this situation, but in order to do this, we must ob obtain data from outside CPD maps. The Data-Driven Decision-Making Toolkit provides several spreadsheets to facilitate advanced issue characterization, which requires data outside of what is available in CPD maps. Advanced issue characterization is important as affordable housing and community development issues are complex and provide a wide range of, and require a wide range of information about them if grantees are to deal with them effectively. There are a number of sources that can provide valuable information on housing issues, including HUD's website, especially the Policy Development and Research website, the American Housing Survey, the 2000 and 2010 censuses, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, or HMDA data, state and local data sources, and universities, think tanks, and foundations. The toolkit will provide more, a more detailed description of these sources and instructions for how to obtain the data and enter it into the spreadsheets. Examining how variables have changed over time, so here we see that we've pulled in some data from the 2000 census to compare to the 2005 to 2009 ACS. So examining how this data has changed over time can help understand whether a problem is getting better or worse in the jurisdiction itself or the larger housing market. These trends can inform potential strategies for addressing the issue. And so in this case, the 2000 census data can be very useful for this purpose. In the case of ha crowded housing in Townville, we see that while the percent of crowded households is much higher than the national rate, it has declined a great deal since 2000. In fact, the crowding issue, a big problem in Townville State, has declined across the state as well. Thus, some state-level market forces may be taking care of the problem. Townville notes that during the last decade, a large amount of housing was built in the state, and despite the foreclosure crisis, this relatively high portion of owner-occupied homes that are experiencing severe overcrowding in the recent data may also be tied to the foreclosure crisis. Having learned about crowding trends in Townville, the planners at Townville have decided to return to CPD maps data and look at other issues affecting their housing situation. Recall from the issue identification table, cost burden was also an issue. So they can turn to the issue characterization spreadsheet back in the data-driven decision-making toolkit that we're going to release uh, to learn what households are experiencing high cost burden. Here we see that the data from CPD maps show that Townville has a higher level of people paying 30% or more of their income for housing than does the nation overall. 
we see that here, that, the, the, that medium blue color. However, this general cost burden level is not much higher than the state, and it's actually lower in comparison to the comparison jurisdiction, Bergton. A cost, as cost burden is further broken down by income here in the bottom half of this chart, it appears that the lower income households are more affected. Townville's cost burden rate for those making less than $35,000 per year is nearly 10 percentage points above the state and national rates. Right here. The toolkit lets us further investigate which households are experiencing high cost burden by breaking this data down further by income. We can see evidence that New State is a high cost market with the portion of owners making more than 30 percent, I'm sorry, excuse me, making more than $35,000 a year and paying more than 30 percent of their income for housing point two at the national level here we see. Breaking down cost burden by tenure also shows the highest percentage of households with this problem are renters. Re renters with household income less than $35,000 a year. Townville's portion of renter households paying more than 30% of income on housing is much higher than even new states, which as we just said was a lot higher than the, than the or is, is, excuse me, moving on. Finally, we see that Townville has more than 36,000 renter units in this income category who are cost burdened. Thus, the planners in Townville, here over here we see that, Thus, the planners in Townville decide to focus on cost burdened renters in their jurisdiction. First, Townville's planners decided to take a look at the extent of cost burden by income category using the, the toolkit. As seen in this table, the lowest income households are particularly burdened in Townville. So that's here, the ones that are zero to 30 percent of AMI cost burden at 30 percent of their income for rent or housing costs, and the ones that paying 50 percent of their income for housing costs, or rent, actually. The trick here is how to interpret the numbers. What is the proper method for comparison and to which place? As you can, as you can see, as you add variables, the numbers get smaller, so we're looking at renters who are cost burdened by income, so we're breaking it down according to three different categories. So as we add variables, the numbers get smaller and smaller, and the difference in percentage points does not get high enough for the data to get flagged. So that's why none of these, none of the variables in this left-hand column have been colored in by the tool. What the data here do tell us is that the lowest income households in Townville are likely where the focus on easing cost burden is most needed. Households making 0 to 30 percent of area median income make up more than half of those with cost burden, with about 30,000 households affected, nearly half of those paying more than 50 percent of their income on rent or housing costs. In addition to housing problems, the data from CPD maps also provides data on the local housing supply. The table from the toolkit that we see here describes the portion of rental units affordable to various income levels and the total number of these units in Townville. From this data, we can see that Townville has a much, high, a much lower, lower portion of rental units affordable to those earning up to 30% of AMI compared to the nation as a whole, though it is similar to new states. So we're looking at this row here. In addition, the supply of units affordable to those earning up to 30% of AMI is much less than the demand for those units. So we see here there's 3,620 units that are affordable to this category, but we had almost 30,000 cost burdened households that are earning 30% of HAMFI. In the prior table, we saw that there, oh, I already said that, excuse me. As the prior advanced issue characterization example, here we incorporate data from the 2000 census. So that's this column here in the middle. Looking at the 
Looking at the change in cost for instance since 2000, the data, which is available from the Census Bureau, we see that the larger, the larger housing market has seen a decline in cost burdened renter households. So that's a new state. In 2000, it was 44.7%. In the, in the 2005 to 2009 ACS data, it's 22%. In 2000, Townville cost burden renters were a lower proportion than the states. However, more recent data show these positions are reversed. So now Townville has a higher proportion that are rent burdened than new states. Townville's affordability problem grew from 24.2% of renters to 31.8%, while new states declined from 44.7 to 22. Similarly, similar to the crowding issue, the change in the severity over the past decade turns out to be a key piece of the analysis. By examining additional issues, by examining additional issue characterization spreadsheets, grantees can better address the questions listed here. Do the housing types affected, I'm sorry, do the house, housing issues affect certain household types? What kind of housing market is my jurisdiction in? Are market forces hurting or helping? What other data information do I need? And where are the affected households? In this limited example, I'm sorry, excuse me. In the limited example of the use of the issue characterization tool, we saw that the crowding issue may be getting resolved through market forces, while the cost burden issue appears to be getting worse. As a result, the city of Townville may want to put a lower priority on overcrowding as an issue than on easing cost burden. A potential strategy to address cost burden could be to focus on rental affordability by encouraging the development of additional affordable units. Understanding the characteristics of housing issues also helps in the next stage of the toolkit, determining where in the jurisdiction these, pro these problems are located. In the issue location stage, we will see how grantees can identify the census tracts where problems identified in the first two stages are concentrated and look for hot spots where housing issues may coincide with demographic conditions. Stage three of the data decision making sorry, excuse me, data-driven decision-making toolkit is designed to help users understand where the issues identified in the first two stages are most prevalent. In this stage, we use CPD maps to compare smaller areas within the jurisdiction and answer the questions, where are, issue, where are the identified problems located? What resources are there to draw on to address these issues? What populations in the jurisdiction are affected? Problem location is important in part because the geography because a geographically concentrated response to a problem can have more impact than one that is spread out. In our example, Townville planners have identified crowding and affordability as housing issues through their use of the data-driven decision-making toolkit and through consultation and public participation. They have also put an, an emphasis on issues affecting the elderly. As a result, they've decided to look into crowd, overcrowded and unaffordable rental housing that may include senior citizens. The issue location tool in the data-driven decision-making toolkit provides threshold suggestions in this slide to use the map query tool in CPD Maps. The map query tool allows you to set criteria that will identify census tracts that meet, that meet those criteria. They, Townsville is going to use the map query tool to find census tracts where more than 10% of the households are overcrowded where less than 35% of rental units are affordable to those with incomes up to 30% of AMI, and where more than 25% of households have at least one person 60 years of age or older. The issue location tool in the toolkit that we're discussing today generates these criteria based on state and national averages and the gap between those rates and the jurisdictions. These criteria act as a starting point for the issue location tool and can be adjusted based on the desired number of tracks the planners wish to identify using the map query tool. The Townville planners have entered the criteria we discussed in the, private, in the previous slide into the map query tool. And as we see, these were pretty tight criteria that identified only three census tracts out of 178 census tracts in Townville. 
The instructions for using the Map Query tool can be found in the CPD Maps Desk Guide or the May 23rd orientation webinar to CPD Maps. Links to the guide and recording of this webinar, oh, I'm sorry, of that webinar will be provided at the end of, of this presentation. So now that they've, they've identified those three tracks, CPD Maps is going to highlight those three tracks on the map and you see where they're highlighted in this slide. The track values for the selected variables are provided when the tract is selected on the map. So you can click on the tract and it will show you in the results what those values are. And so in this way, planners can identify the tracts of interest in their location. If they want to find out more about these particular tracts, they can download track level reports from CPD Maps into the data-driven decision-making tool and repeat the issue identification and issue characterization stages at the track level to get more information and understand more about what's going on in these smaller areas. So going on to what does this mean for your consolidated plan and the process of identifying priorities and goals. Data analysis in combination with other parts of the planning process, such as public participation and consultation, can help grantees determine their housing priorities and begin to set their goals. The data-driven decision-making toolkit will help grantees examine the characteristics of the housing issues facing their jurisdiction, including comparisons to other geographic levels, and help locate parts of their jurisdiction that are affected and what resources may be available there. The data helps Townville place a priority on addressing cost-burdened households over other housing issues when they learned that their numbers are high relative to the nation, though not necessarily to the housing market they were in and that there are many households affected, most of them renter households, and that the supply of affordable homes is much less than the demand. In the example described in this webinar, data helped Townville planners to set goals that are realistic and attainable by helping them to understand the extent of the need and how it has changed. Recall that increase in cost burden renters in Townville. In further analysis, they may also identify other goals that can relate to this one. For instance, they may find that they have high concentration of older housing that can be rehabilitated and made available at rents affordable to their cost burdened renter population. Once the priorities and goals are set, the plan should include of the jurisdiction that can help with meeting the goals of the plan. The data-driven decision-making toolkit will include an institutional resource matrix to help grantees identify what resources are available to address priorities and goals, what institutions can provide them, what are these institutions' capacities or limitations, and where are they located within the jurisdiction. This matrix will provide a method for looking at the institutions that can help in plan implementation and provide a and seeing at a glance what resources they may provide, how they work towards the goals identified in the plan, and what limitations there are in their ability, in their ability to assist Townville in meeting their goals. To recap, data can help grantees use their resources most effectively by providing insight into where the need and potential for success are greatest. The data-driven decision-making toolkit can help grantees to better understand the nature of the problems they face and design strategies based on those conditions. By identifying the number of households, housing units, and people in need, the toolkit can help grantees identify strategies and realistic goals in an action plan based on those numbers. In our example, again, Townville identified a need for affordable rental housing units, but it also found that few are currently available. The high cost market in which Townville is located probably makes the development of rental housing that is affordable to those making less than half the area median income very difficult. What strategies will the Townville planners use to address their need for affordable rental property? They'll need to look into partners. They will also need to leverage their funds as their need is likely to be much greater than the resources that will be provided. They will be able to use their findings from the data analysis and in consultation with potential program and funding partners. Whatever strategies the planners ultimately propose, they will also have maps and data to back them up to the public and to decision makers. In the end, the planners will also be able to track these data to demonstrate the impact their strategies are having in their communities.
In addition to having good data to make decisions, Townville planners will also have the data for goals, outputs, and outcomes. The use of this data will help them more easily and accurately answer the following questions as they develop indicators for their Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, or CAPER. The questions that they, that, what they will want to answer at that point are what are your desired outcomes, which goals are related to them, and what outputs will be measured. The Consolidated Plan provides the Consolidated Plan template in IDIS, I should say, provides 22 goal outcome indicators that are related to outputs created by resources HUD provides. Sorry, excuse me. That are related to the outputs that are reported for the resources that HUD provides. These standardized indicators allow you to connect the goals you set in a Consolidated Plan to the outcomes you report in connection to your activities. In Townville's case, the planners look to develop affordable rental housing for their jurisdiction and set goals based in part on the extent of their need, and a very large need was identified, and on the limits of funding provided. Townville will be counting rental unit development for its goal outcome indicator to measure progress towards its desired outcome of increased affordability for decent housing. They'll also, though, be able to track the level of cost burden in their community over time to find out if these units are having the desired impact. So that concludes the presentation for today. The, um, we'll leave the slide up during question and answer. Um, it lists some key resources that you'll be able to, um, that were re referenced throughout the presentation. The Consolidated Plan website, and it's important to note that when the data-driven decision-making toolkit is complete, it will be posted on the website, and you'll be able to download it, and instructions for using it, and the guide will also be posted there. The CPD maps page on the Consolidated Plan website, as well as the, the desk guide links are here. And also, you can use the, the final link here to view archived webinars on CPD maps and other components of the econ planning suite. So with that, we'll go to questions. So we had a question regarding IDIS access for consultants that assist with preparation of the consolidated plan. Um, the question is, can another, if you're a consultant that already has access in IDIS, can another grantee provide you with access to assist? Yes, they can. They just need to request access for you to IDIS the same way they request it for, their, for any of their other staff members. Um, we had a question about whether it's possible to print the information that appears in the grantee summary box in CPD Maps. Yeah, uh, that is something that actually we, you can't do now, but in November when the next, um, when updates to CPD Maps are posted, you will actually have that, uh, that capability. Um, it's actually, we've been testing it, it's working, you just have to wait until November and you'll be able to print that information. Um, the next question is that HUD is using a 10% threshold for housing problems. However, this is within the margin of error for the American Housing Survey in urban areas and even worse in rural areas. Um, will HUD be changing this to reflect flaws in the data? This was a, um, a question I think that um, our consultants from Econometrica, Lee, I think you might be able to answer this. Yes. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Uh, the issue is we're, we're trying to find a difference between your jurisdiction and another. And we know that these are point estimates. And you're right, there is a margin of error. Uh, however, the idea is to use the point estimates as best as we can to get an idea, is there a big difference? And yes, the margin of error might overwhelm that, but we wouldn't know in which direction. And we wouldn't know uh, wh whether the margin is also larger for the comparison geography. So we're trying to do that as best as we can, but I think we take your point about the rural areas and say, yeah, maybe we need to, because most of the, the tool was based looking at uh, metropolitan areas and urban areas uh, and see if there is a bigger difference between uh, when making comparisons for rural areas that might make criteria, a different criteria more sensible. For rural, so we're going to we're going to take a look into that and, and talk to some other friends who have a lot of uh, more rural experience in, in this area. I also wanted to just remind folks that um, if you have.
special knowledge of some of the margins of error in some of these data, you're more familiar with them, or if there are thresholds that make more sense to you, the, there's a control panel in the toolkit that allows you actually to adjust the thresholds to um, make them either greater or, or lower so that you can um, maybe adjust it for some of that sensitivity that you're talking about to margins of error. Um, we had a question here about whether CPD would be suggesting comparative geographies or jurisdictions. This is another one that um, Econometrica can handle. But yes, we're going to, in, in the guide, we have a description of ways to select comparison jurisdictions. What are good jurisdictions, uh, characteristics you could look at very quickly and say, okay, this is a good one to compare my jurisdiction with. Again, we, we in the guide, we're going to be recommending you look at a larger jurisdiction than your own that uh, your jurisdiction is in. Say, Townville looked at its relationship to New State because it's within New State, and that's an important comparison, as are the nation. But we will also have guidance on picking other jurisdictions as well. OK, we have. Um a question about in stage two, I mean, I think this has to do with the, um, well, that's, that's the issue characterizations um, stage. Can, the question is, can you shade all compared areas, such as New State and Bergton, relative to US levels as well? And that would make the comparison between Townville and the other local areas e easier. We are looking at ways to do things like that in the in the draft toolkit, and so we will take that um, under advisement. As far as the other thing that um, you can also do using the toolkit is um, change the comparison you're making from comparing Townville, for instance, to the US, which is what we use throughout the demonstration. You could also change that setting to compare Townville to Bergton or compare Townville to New State so that you can see how those differences come and go. Um, we have a question, will this tool be available to members of the general public? Yeah, it will be. It's going to be posted on the Consolidated Plan website. And it can be downloaded by anybody who has access to the website, which is everybody. It's a public site. Uh, we have a question about whether we'll be able to download shapefiles or data from the CPD mapping website to use with GIS maps we create in-house. There are several layers um, that are in CPD maps now that are currently available as map services. Those are, if you go to the Consolidated Plan website and click on, is it data? There's a data page off in the menu on the right-hand side. Closer to the bottom, you see HUD mapping services. That's a link to the data that you can access by map service into your own um, GIS mapping software that, for the maps that you're creating in-house. Um, and the boundary files are also there. We've gotten some questions about um, state-specific trainings on this. The toolkit and the guide should, create, should include some examples for um, for states, we've asked for that specifically, but we also will look into um, doing a webinar for states specifically. The next question is if we make such specific goals based on data, won't we run the risk of not spending money in a timely manner because we can't find um, partners with, them, with capacity? That's a really great question, and it's really important to note here, while this webinar is focusing really heavily on the data-driven decision-making, that's only one piece of your planning process. Institutional delivery structure is an important part of a strategic plan, really identifying where you have capacity to accomplish goals and where you don't. So you want to set your goals based on all of those things, using the data, but then also looking at what other resources you have, including partner capacity to accomplish those goals as well. Uh, we have a question about how would a county choose a larger jurisdiction other than the state? You can choose, um, it just depends on how you're going to, you download the reports from CPD maps for your primary jurisdiction and for your comparison jurisdiction. So if you wanted to choose another larger, say you're a, a town within a county and you want your county to be one of your comparison jurisdictions, you can do that. If you want a whole region of like a collection of counties, 
you could download the report for that larger area, and that would al that could also be um, that would address or would be the data that's loaded into the toolkit. Uh, we have the a question about whether data will always be presented at the tract level, or if blog groups will be added later. If the census is able to release data at the block group level that, I mean, we, we, all, we had a question just now about the reliability of census track data and the, the large margins of error of census track data. For block groups, it's even worse. And they don't recommend using block group data the way that we're using it in CPD maps. So until that data gets more reliable, we're going to be sticking with the census track level. And also, it helps us in looking at data sources outside of census, because not all, most data sources are available at the census track level. Not all data sources are available at block group. So we're trying to uh, make sure that as we go forward and we're looking at other sources even outside of census that we're able to um, create and provide them all in the same format. And I think that that's the extent of the questions that we have for now. Um, we really hope that you'll be, um, filling out the survey at the end of this. We will use that to, in as we're finishing up the toolkit and getting ready to release it. And also, we just ask that you watch the Confline website for the release of that toolkit, hopefully by the end of August, if not early September. And you'll, we will, when it is released, we will announce it through the 1CPD listserv. So if you aren't um, subscribed to that listserv yet, it's pretty easy. Go to the 1CPD resource exchange and sign up. But I think that that concludes the webinar for today. Okay. Thank you, Meg, and thank you, Caitlin, who worked on this as well. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for taking the time to attend today's webinar. Please, as Meg said, complete the survey if you can that will appear in your internet browser immediately after the webinar has ended so we can get your thoughts for future webinars. Also, as mentioned, the recording of this presentation will be available on the Consolidated Plan website on the TA and Training page. We will be holding a question and answer webinar in late September. The registration information will be posted for that on the Consolidated Plan website, also under Training and TA and will also be sent through the CPD listservs. Once again, on behalf of the Office of Community Planning and Development, thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day.